Hello and welcome. This is Kristen Hanshorst, Project Lead on Women's Heart and Brain Health Research with the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Today, I'm pleased to introduce some important work that has been led and undertaken by the Native Women's Association of Canada. Profiling this work has been made possible through the Advancing Women's Heart and Brain Health Research Network. This work has been part of a five-year agreement with Health Canada to advance research on women's heart and brain health. And as part of this agreement, 15 researchers have been funded. In addition to funding research, convening people with lived experience, researchers, practitioners, and policy experts as part of a network represents our commitment to building awareness, facilitating access to information, and improving technical capacity and professional development for the next generation of investigators around women's heart and brain health. Membership is open. If you'd like more information about our research network, please email me at kristen.hansource at heartandstroke.ca. Now, without further delay, I will introduce our speaker, Tamsin Fitzgerald. Tamsin works as the Gender-Based Analysis Policy Advisor for the Native Women's Association of Canada. In this capacity, she's responsible for ensuring that all NWAC materials, recommendations, projects, and programs employ a culturally relevant, distinction-based, and trauma-informed approach. Tamsin is also the co-founder of Defend Choice, a local reproductive rights organization that helped implement the injunction zones around Ontario clinics and hospitals. A graduate of Queen's University's Gender Studies program, Tamsin also holds a Master of Political Management from Carleton University. And without further delay, Tamsin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen, and, and thank you for allowing me the time and space to be here. I, I really appreciate it. Um, my, my name is Tamsin, and I am the uh, gender-based and uh, culturally relevant gender-based analysis policy advisor here at uh, NWAC, and I would like to acknowledge that I am a settler here on Anishinaabe land. Um, so again, thank you for allowing me the time to speak about this. Um, I'll, just, I'll just provide a little bit of background on uh, NWAC and, and, and some, uh, some information about us. So we were founded in 1974, and uh, based on the collective goal to enhance, promote, and foster the social, economic, cultural, and political well-being of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women. So we, we do apply a culturally relevant gender-based perspective to health, human rights, legal, and policy issues just to ensure that decision makers of all kinds at all levels are aware of equity gaps and issues that affect Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people. And just for the sake of simplicity, when I talk about a culturally relevant gender-based analysis, I will refer to it from here on out as a CRGBA. Um, so that brings me to our, our next topic. What is CRGBA and, and why do we need it? Um, within mainstream society, gender-based analysis or GBA as a concept was founded in tandem with second wave feminism and activism around wage equality, gender-based violence and reproductive rights. So although there have been major strides in achieving equality for women that can't be disputed. Um, feminism as a movement has often been for and by privileged women, so white, middle class, cisgender women typically. Um, and so disparities still exist within health, social, political, and economic sectors, particularly where women are at the intersections of multiple forms of marginalization. And here in Canada, these disparities are often magnified for Indigenous women and gender diverse people. Um, so in both an Indigenous and Canadian context, making a GBA culturally relevant means accounting for the array of histories, experiences, and socioeconomic uh, outcomes of colonization on First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, a CRGBA is definitely needed just because any policy decision that affects people and land affects Indigenous women. Um, Indigenous women's identities are and always have been intrinsically linked to the land, and that has to be at the forefront of understanding how policy decisions will impact them, especially those made by the government and on their behalf. So the purpose of a GBR, GBA is to meaningfully address the disparities that exist across and between genders, as well as account for the distinct lived experiences and needs of racialized women. So CRGBA uh, highlights the ways in which identical treatment of genders does not produce the same outcomes. And in fact, this treatment often magnifies existing inequalities and structural barriers faced by marginalized people. So 
uh, CRGBA and employing a CRGBA is integral in making policy decisions uh, so that they are evidence-based as uh, the evidence should sway and inform decisions and policy development. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit next just about sex and gender and, and current definitions that we have around them and, and the, 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 the very dire need to decolonize our understandings of sex and gender. So when you are doing a CRGBA, it's, in, it's very important to incorporate inclusive and non-binary definitions of sex and gender into your work. Um, this is an important step in working to decolonize these understandings of sex and gender. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time now to delve a bit deeper into our understandings of sex and gender um, and some terminology that we'll be using just before we move on. So please take note uh, just that most of these terms are Western definitions of sex, gender, and, and gender diversity. Um, but there are also community specific words that express gender diversity in indigenous languages. But because of assimilation efforts and colonization, language extraction has meant that some of these words and understandings have been lost. So uh, gender and sex are both concepts that have been socially constructed as binary and non-moving over the life course, um, especially after European contact. And so some of this might not be new information for many of you, but we're just going to go through the definitions together to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, so just speaking further to uh, decolonizing sex and gender, gender uh, refers to the ways that masculinity and femininity have been socially constructed and reinforced by the dominant or mostly Western culture through norms and stereotypes. Um, it's been con socially constructed as binary, usually through classifications of women or man, as you, woman or man, excuse me. Um, but even though this is not the reality of how gender is experienced internally, which is known as gender identity, or expressed externally, which is known as gender expression. Um, so I, I'm also going to speak a little bit about uh, assigned sex. And uh, so this definition and the word assigned is used because doctors will usually determine a baby to be either male or female when the baby is born. And doctors assign sex based on chromosomes and genitals. So uh, the way that these characteristics manifest in individuals' bodies is diverse. And it's not as definite as bin or binary as the categories of male and female suggest. So sex is not only assigned, uh, but the binary sex categories of male and female are also social constructed. Um, so for some people uh, this means that their gender identity is consistent with their assigned sex but for some people it's different and this means that some people who were assigned male or female at birth uh, express different gender identities later in life. So those people whose gender identity and assigned sex are the same are called cisgender and those who are not are called transgender. Um, so we're just going to slide into uh, now indigenous languages and understandings of gender diversity, just the, the next one. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about two-spirit people. So two-spirit is a term used by some indigenous people to self-identify. It's an indigenous specific term exclusive to indigenous people. Um, and while the term itself is Anishinaabe, it, it, it's been taken up by different indigenous nations to describe complex experiences and identities as well as cultural roles and responsibilities. So the term two-spirit is a translation of the Anishinaabe word nis mani due, which is a direct translation, and it refers to a person who embodies both feminine and masculine spirits. Um, typically, this term is used to acknowledge the, um, the effects that colonization has had on gender, and it's used to also acknowledge the intersecting aspects of identity as well. Um, so it was coined by Myra Laramie in 1990, and other nations do have their own terms, but this is the one that's most, most commonly used. Um, and just a little bit of background, to Two-spirit can sometimes refer to sexual orientation, other times gender identity, depending on the individual and their particular nation. So it's there's no one-size-fits-all definition for two-spirit. And it's also important to know um, that just because an Indigenous person identifies as LGBTQ um, does not necessarily mean that they identify as two-spirit either. Um, it's also important to note that LGBTQ is an acronym that's used as a way to shorthand both queer and trans identities, as well as sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so just uh, just a little bit of background. Prior to colonization, a lot of indigenous communities had community specific understandings of sex and gender diversity. All across Turtle Island, there have been documented accounts of multiple gender roles beyond just man and woman. Um, and so at this time, uh, two-spirit people have been respected by their communities. They were valued for their gifts and accepted for who they were and, and the balance that they offered in our communities. 
But when settlers arrived, they were confused by two-spirit people. And so they imposed a gender binary just as a violent tool to assimilate indigenous peoples into Western European norms. So they did this through Christian missions, through the residential school system, uh, and legislation such as the Indian Act. So it left uh, indigenous communities extremely unbalanced with respect to their original structures. And it resulted in much less care and respect that has been given to indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people. Um, even more dev devastatingly in uh, a lot of communities, traditional understandings of sex and gender as spectrums have been lost. So um, uh, traditional understandings of sex and gender have been altered, especially women's traditional roles. They've been removed from you know, high decision-making roles to, to just be regarded as second-class citizens through, um, through these Christian missions, residential schools, and legislation. So um, uh, culturally relevant gender-based analysis needs to account for these things, especially. Um, so just sliding into uh, NWAC's CRGBA, uh, it was developed as a tool for people in policy, academia, and government to think about the gendered impacts of issues that affect Indigenous women and gender diverse persons specifically. And it's not meant to be prescriptive, it's really just to be, uh, it's just meant to be some guidelines for starting to think about these things through. So it uh, taking a holistic and inclusive approach to CRGBA is necessary so that we aren't replicating, you know, the harmful structures uh, in research with Indigenous people. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time to break down what CRGBA looks like by discussing culturally specific understandings of kinship systems and gender and gender diversity and uh, how they've been disrupted through colonization. So there's four phases and we're going to start with the pre-colonization stage. Um, so what this looked like back then before European contact was Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and gender diverse persons had important roles in communities, uh, especially with regard to fostering health and wellness. Um, indigenous understandings of health and wellness were in integral, integral to daily life and indigenous nations were healthy and uh, self-determining. So questions that you consider at this stage of your analysis are what were the, commu the specific communities understandings of health and wellness like prior to colonization? What medical practice, medicinal practices were common? What community specific understandings of sex, gender, governance structures uh, were in place prior to colonization? Um, just as, as an example, health um, before colonization was understood holistically. It encompassed physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional realms. And it uh, traditional life, lifestyles often included lots of physical activity, which were easier, um, which made it easier to access healthy traditional food. So that's that was what uh, things looked like before um, colonization, and then we move into the colonization and assimilation point of history. So um, what this looked like for what this looked like for at the time was it included dispossession of indigenous nations as being crucial to the colonizers goal of obtaining indigenous lands. So of course healthy indigenous nations stood in the way of this, um, especially indigenous women's and girls bodies because they were seen as the bodies that reproduce nations. And so they were specifically targeted by colonial policies such as the Indian Act that denied many women's status and disenfranchised franchise them and remove them from their communities and the benefits that they were entitled to. Um, and this, of course, does include two-spirit and gender diverse bodies uh, who were also seen as threats to the goals of assimilation. So um, they imposed the gender binary, disease has been introduced through contact and with devastating effects, and traditional lifestyles and diets were forcibly and violently altered. So at this point, questions to ask yourself are to examine how these pre-existing community structures, as well as their values, have been altered through processes of colonization. Um, um, there was a paper that was written in 2017 that's been published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and it discussed the effects of forced starvation on childhood development and how a child's body becomes programmed towards a tendency to store fat when nutritional food does become available if they have experienced long periods of hunger. So um, similarly, there have also been population health studies on these on children that were exposed to 20th century famines in the Netherlands, Russia, China. Um, these children exhibited greater prevalences of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension as well as greater incidences of heart attack and stroke into adulthood. So um, this paper discusses the effects of childhood under nutrition as, as being not limited to their life course alone. Uh, so those risk factors for diabetes and heart disease are passed on to subsequent generations because of it. Um, so moving on to the third stage, which is where we are right now at this point in time. So current social and political realities for Indigenous peoples. Right now, what we're looking at is we're looking at increasing 
high, incredibly high rates of violence against indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people. It's systemic. It continues through social, political, legal, educational, uh, and healthcare systems. You know, the, we're looking at four centuries of violence that have been passed down through intergenerational and ongoing trauma, and the violence that these women have experienced now manifests in their own communities. So questions that you ask yourself at this point are, as a result of these processes of colonizations, what are the contemporary lived realities of these individuals in their specific community contexts? Um, so as an example, indigenous women and gender diverse people experience high rates of chronic diseases, such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, um, but they also face barriers in accessing healthcare and they often experience racism and stigma within these systems. So um, for example, there have been cases of indigenous women going into the ER while experiencing a heart attack, but they're turned away because they're thought to be intoxicated. Um, so food insecurity, as another example, is uh, a, as an issue, insecurity is prevalent in remote and rural areas due to inaccessibility and in urban areas, due to affordability of safe and nutritious foods. So hunting traditional foods is becoming harder, especially in the North, due to environmental pollutants and climate change. Um, so that's where we are currently, but we're going to be looking forward a little bit now into the fourth stage, which includes strategies and responses. So um, what this looks like ideally is community self-determination, cult cultural revitalization, you know, revitalization of indigenous languages, uh, legislation that advocates for, advocates for the rights, health, and wellness of indigenous people or indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse persons. So questions that we ask looking forward are, are just looking at some of the ways in which we can work to restore social, cultural, political, and economic balance, as well as health and wellness to our communities. So whether that means implementing the truth and reconciliation calls to action or or applying the universal, sorry, the United Nations Declaration of the on the rights of Indigenous peoples, or implementing Jordan's principle here in Canada. So, just in thinking about these four different areas, we're looking at how gender and kinship relationships were understood in specific community contexts prior to contact, um, how these understandings have been forcibly altered, um, and how this impacts contemporary issues that relate to Indigenous women today. So, um, the last section, you know, strategies and responses, just asks us to think about how we can restore social, cultural, political, and economic balance to our communities, especially in relation to the specific community context that we're applying this CRGBA to. Um, so uh, it's also important to note that when we're looking, or when we're thinking about this last question, we need to think beyond approaches and solutions that are situated within Western ways of thinking, which means uh, there are a lot of questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're doing a CRGBA, um, particularly because hundreds of years of colonization and patriarchy have resulted in the silencing of these women and individuals. So uh, in, addition, in addition to making for better, more evidence-based policy, we have to ask ourselves these questions because it's a key part of anti-oppression and bringing those voices to the foreground. So we're not, we're not, um, we're not kind of working to hear the, the voices or the, the voices of the voiceless. We're working to hear those of the voices of those who've been silenced. And that's a really important distinction to make. So um, in conducting a CRGBA and policies, um, consider the following questions in, in these key areas. So the first area is in, uh, in the area of knowledge. Um, so asking yourself, does the program, the policy, the research, does it place value on non-Western ways of knowing and transmitting knowledge, such as storytelling or land-based learning or spending time with elders? Um, many indigenous knowledge systems put an emphasis on storytelling, song, and dance as a way to share experiences and teachings, as well as as an embodiment of culture. So in the history of Western research, this has resulted in indigenous knowledges being dismissed as invalid or superstitious or being relegated to art rather than truth. So ask yourself, or how are you collecting this data? Are you putting weight on qualitative information rather than only on statistical information? And do you have the participants informed consent? So knowledge is incredibly important when applying a CRGBA. Um, the, next, the next point especially is employing a distinctions-based approach. And what this means is it means considering whether the project that you're looking at recognizes and accounts for the distinct lived experiences between and among First Nations, Inuit, and Métis individuals. So those on reserve, off reserve, those with status, those without status, um, those in Inuit Nanangat or, you know, in urban areas or uh, just not applying a pan-Indigenous approach to your work. So there's no singular experience of being a woman and uh, colonialism has played out differently in different parts of Turtle Island as well. Just as an example, um, between 1950 to 1975, the Canadian government decimated the population of sled dogs as a means to end Inuit ways of living and to force communities to adapt to a stationary way of living. So uh, 
basically to assimilate. And this is an Inuit specific ex experience of colonialism that has lasting and lingering impacts today. Um, so of course, within this indigenous women and two-spirit people have been specifically targeted for colonial violence and disempowerment. So um, when you're looking at a distinctions-based approach, you have to ask yourself, am I aware of and I, am I accounting for the diversity of histories and traumas related to colonialism? Um, so of course, when educating yourself, do seek out accounts that are written by indigenous people and, and we can provide a list of suggested reading as well. Um, and the next uh, the next aspect of, uh, of uh, applying a CRGBA is asking yourself about gender diversity. So does this program uh, is it gender inclusive and non-binary does it recognize that gender and sex are spectrums we've spoken about this a little bit so I won't go too much into detail but prior to colonization indigenous communities had their own distinct understandings of gender roles and they were very much based on the notion of balance and and that has since been disrupted so ask yourself during this time what what do I understand gender diversity to be and am I making assumptions about a person's gender orientation or sexual history um, the next question to ask, and, and, and we've kind of spoken a bit at length too, is in regards to intersectionality. So I'm sure many of you have heard this word before, um, and, and what it speaks to is it speaks to asking yourself about whether the project you're working on accounts for intersecting identities as the foundation rather than as a matter of inclusion. So um, as an example, there are unique barriers to employment faced by trans women who also have disabilities. So um, people who live at multiple intersections of access are left out of policy and service programming. They're not considered in the decision making. Or if they are considered, they're only considered from you know one aspect of uh, of their identity. So um, ask yourself, are you listening to and accounting for experiences and identities that are distinct from your own? How are you doing this? And how are you ensuring that this policy is responsive to the experiences of these people who false, face multiple kinds of barriers? Um, so when you're looking at intersectionality, you're looking at you know aspects of race, class, ability, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, location, the impacts of colonization and cultural identity. So by asking these questions, we can see whose voices are being heard and who is you know, who is benefiting from these programs and policies, as well as who is not benefiting and who is being historically left out. Um, and, and what that speaks a little bit further to in regards to intersectionality is unpacking values for yourself. Uh, so at an individual level, much of conducting CRGBA means that you have to unpack long held beliefs about marginalized people. Some of these we, we don't even know that we hold, hold until we you know look, look a little deeper. So this means addressing your privilege, encountering internalized colonial values and patriarchy. So it means having to ask yourself, uh, and answer uncomfortable questions about beliefs and ideas that may not have a clear source or origin because they're a part of the culture in which we live, but for, you know, still need to be absolutely addressed. So asking yourself, what ideas do I honestly hold about Indigenous people in their communities, about Indigenous women? What spaces make me feel safe or unsafe and how do others experience those? Um, what understandings do I hold about who falls into the categories of men and women? How should they behave? What are these ideas informed by and when did I form them? Um, so initially taking a look at yourself and, and trying to be as objective as possible while also recognizing the, the place of privilege that you do occupy. Um, so more questions to ask in regards to unpacking values are just in, in you know the domain of feeling defensive because that's a natural you know that's a very natural response I think when confronted with um, you know different ideas that you you don't expect or you haven't heard about before so it's a common response to unpacking values and privilege and especially because they're deeply ingrained facets of identity without a clear source of origin so um, when you or someone you know or, or someone you know are working with uh, Sorry, when you or someone that you know are working with uh, feeling, I'm sorry, this is not written well. When you or someone you know are working on something that makes you feel defensive or you feel the defensiveness rising, it can be really useful to just pause, you know, take a moment to step back and ask yourself, why am I feeling defensive? What am I defending and why? Um, you know, for what purpose? Who benefits by my being defensive? Am I actively listening to what other people's experiences are? And can I accept that they're different from my own and that this actually isn't an attack on my worth? Um, uh, so we're going to just go into a little case study now about some questions uh, further to, you know, considering questions to ask yourself while going through this example um, about 
about uh, just this food example, sorry. So um, prior to colonization, what might a community's relationship to food have looked like? Um, another question to consider, how has this relationship been affected by colonization or assimilation? And how might cultural genocide have impacted an indigenous woman's ability to pass on cultural teachings and knowledge about food preparation? Uh, what are current social and political realities of the situation? How might food insecurity have impacted someone's relationship to their food systems? And what are some strategies and responses for repairing this relationship? So all of these questions are just the four stages that we went through a little while ago. Um, and just further to this example, uh, so food is an integral part of Indigenous culture. Uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis traditional foods are connected to their specific land base, and Indigenous people's cultural knowledge is tied to the land, water, and animals. So Indigenous women play a very, very important role in transmitting cultural teachings and knowledge to new generations on how to prepare traditional food. So each indigenous community relies on different uh, different traditional foods. So an example, Inuit rely on hunting seals and fishing for Arctic char. Um, many coastal interior and interior First Nations in BC rely on salmon. Um, community members from here in Ontario at Curve Lake First Nation gather wild rice. Métis women have traditionally dried and smoked meat. So it's very different across all of the communities. But Together, it's all holistic and very sustainable, and it's based on mutual respect for the animals they hunt and the fruits and vegetables they harvest. So as a result of the residential school system, there's been, a, as, as well as the pollution of indigenous traditional lands and the ongoing effects of colonialism, many teachings regarding traditional indigenous food systems have not been passed on to new generations. So uh, what this means is that the introduction of Western processed foods in indigenous communities has changed many people's relationships with their food, which has ultimately led many indigenous communities Communities to collectively consume less traditional foods and as a result many communities face poorer health outcomes including hypertension diabetes cardiovascular disease and stroke um, so part of implementing a CRGVA lens into this work that you do must acknowledge the the damage that the introduction of Western processed foods and ongoing environmental degradation has caused to indigenous communities um, so indigenous women their children and their families have all faced unique barriers to affordable nutritious and safe food um, so it's really important to take gender into account when considering food security and subsequent health outcomes. Um, food Insecurity Policy Research Canada defines food insecurity as the inadequate or insecure access to food and it is a serious public health problem in Canada. It negatively impacts physical, mental and social health. So poverty, food security and other indicators are highly intertwined complex issues as they relate to Indigenous women's abilities to uh, access food. Um, so strategies and responses for repairing this relationship are happening at the federal level through the implementation of UNDRIP or the United Nations Declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples, um, which in Article 29 states that Indigenous people have the right to the conservation and protection of the environment um, uh, and the productive capacity of their lands, territories and researchers. So uh, as researchers and as frontline care workers, something else that you need to consider as a strategy or response would be to, as we spoke about, place value on non-Western forms of knowledge. So storytelling, sharing circles, land-based learning, time with elders, um, uh, and a specific example, if you wanted to learn about traditional understandings of gender diversity in a specific community, that might mean sitting down with elders or sitting down with two-spirit people who hold these teachings. Um, as a little bit of background, education has been used as a tool of oppression for Indigenous peoples through the residential school system, and it does continue to be a site of systemic and personal oppression for Indigenous peoples. Um, actually, some researchers and educators have suggested that using only a Western paradigm of both health and education with Indigenous peoples is a form of continued colonial oppression and it continues to perpetuate intergenerational trauma. So if we're looking at how we can restore social, cultural and community balance with regards to a specific, specific issue, this means we have to take a decolonizing approach to sharing and gathering knowledge. Um, another important point on that note to talk about is that Western uh, definitions of what counts as knowledge and you know what constitutes good, reliable, objective data has always had a long history of harming, excluding, stigmatizing and even silencing indigenous communities. I mean, in a lot of indigenous communities, research itself is a bad word and it conjures up really negative memories of, uh, of uh, you know, Western academics coming in and basically seeing the benefit of their particular research projects as serving a greater good for mankind rather than coming in to help these Indigenous people or, or benefit them as well. And, um, and so there are power structures in any sort of community-based research or research with Indigenous peoples that privilege privilege the researcher in academic institutions. So taking a decolonized approach means working to undo our own assumptions about what constitutes research and objective knowledge. And it means 
means, again, placing value on non-Western forms of knowledge. Um, so I just wanted to exam uh, just illustrate some examples of uh, social determinants of health among indigenous peoples um, and uh, and kind of due to the history of colonization, uh, the broad range of health and social issues that indigenous people have experienced. So poverty, substance abuse, unemployment, exposure to environmental contaminants, discrimination within the justice system, inadequate water supplies and waste disposal and poor housing quality. So uh, with regards to positive health determinants, what non-indigenous peoples have, indigenous peoples, uh, uh, what what non-Indigenous peoples have, uh, not Indigenous peoples have much less of it, and also have the added burden of the legacy of the residential school system, the 60s scoop, and and current discrimination. So um, we're going to look now at Indigenous determinants of health, um, because these social determinants of health define health based on issues created by colonization and by colonial standards. They're very pathological based, you know, um, deficit based. To ways to ways to examine their health. And so prior to colonization, uh, indigenous communities had their own ways of defining health and well-being, which included elders and traditional knowledge, language, being on the land, the health of the land, traditional foods, um, community, ceremony, love and relationships and building those kinship systems and going beyond blood for that. So this list allows us to consider determinants of health from outside Western knowledge frameworks. And it's really useful to keep in mind when evaluating outcomes of a research project. So um, often indigenous health or uh, research outcomes are difficult to measure because the indicators being used are often Western indicators that don't allow Align with Western knowledges or beliefs about health and wellness, and and so that discrepancy just creates huge gaps in research and and the the services that these these women can access, and it flips the conversation from one of deficits to one that is strength based, and it provides tangible positive outcomes that communities and and, individ, and individuals can feasibly work towards. So I'm ending on a positive note, just because I know I have been a bit critical in this presentation. So I, I do want to end on a positive note that you know looks forward and says that there, we can do this work together. Um, and then and to ask yourself what do you think of this list and, and how much you incorporate this list into your work and applying a more positive aspect to um to you know somewhat bleaker circumstances when it comes to current health situations for indigenous peoples as a result of colonialism so i just want to thank you so much for for uh, allowing me the time allowing NWAC the time to speak about this it's an issue that's very near and dear to our heart and one that we can all work uh work towards together so Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself. My name is Tamson Fitzgerald, T. Fitzgerald at nwac.ca. I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, miigwech, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Tamson. I'd also like to thank the Native Women's Association of Canada for leading this important work. I hope that you have all found this interesting and relevant for your work today. Um, again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at Heart and & Stroke, and we look forward to continued relationship. Thank you.